It's a terrible irony. Heart disease is Australia's biggest killer, yet we have one of the lowest organ donation rates in the world. The wait for a transplant can be agonisingly long. Often it's fatal, but there's been some remarkable progress in recent times. Doctors can now keep their patients alive for months, even years, by hooking them up to artificial pumps. It's amazing stuff, and that's just the start of it. In the future, these machines will be so small they will actually replace the human heart. Do they have to put you open and put the heart in it with cords coming out? Yeah. So At 35, Wayne Griffin's heart is failing and there's no hope it will ever recover. Now he has to explain to his nine-year-old daughter, Ebony, how he's going to survive without it. How did they cut it open? Um, with a saw. No, but how do you cut it open without killing you? It's a hard story to tell a kid, because in the coming months, Dad will be kept alive, not by a donor heart, but by a machine. Whose heart is it? It's not a real heart. What is it? It's a special heart that does the same job as your heart. But so how can you use it? Uh, plugs in into me. Ebony's not the only one coming to terms with all of this. It's a procedure so new to Australia, this is only the second time the heart surgery team here at Sydney St Vincent's Hospital has performed it. Everything's set to go, Wayne's fast asleep, and uh, we'll go in and open the chest and, and remove Wayne's heart. OK, uh, this is a seat. Wayne's heart might look to be pumping vigorously, but a congenital condition has weakened it beyond repair, and unceremoniously, unsentimentally, it's removed. That most emotive, most powerful, dare we say it, the most romantic of human organs. So we obviously have to get all the air out of the pump. Is all but completely replaced by pumps and tubes, valves and bolts. These here, as you can see, are the drive lines, which uh, go out through Wayne's body. They look and sound like a small swimming pool filter. But the total artificial heart keeps patients like Wayne alive for those precious months when their old heart has given up so and the live uh, transplant is heart. still on the way. So here's um, Wayne's new heart. It's just a pump and you take out the pump and throw it in a bucket and replace it with two plastic ventricles. We're just plumbers, you know, we cut and sew, we put in artificial hearts and, you know, if our plumbing breaks down like mine did this morning, you don't have any hot water, you're in trouble. <laughs> Dr. Jack Copeland is the father of this little lifesaver, ensuring more than 700 patients around the world have made it to the top of heart transplant waiting lists. Now, the, the pneumatic idea is a, is a pretty easy one. Mm. It just... Yeah. It even sounds like a human heart. So you could probably keep yourself alive by blowing in the thing or having a little squeeze. Sounds like the perpetual motion machine. That's make. right. You just don't want to get tired. <laughs> But implanting the device is no simple procedure. The left and right ventricles of the damaged heart must be removed and the artificial chambers attached to take their place. They take on the job of pushing and pulling blood throughout the body, all driven by an external pneumatic pump. It's just down to, to blood pumping. All it does is pump blood. In a world where donor hearts are in desperately short supply, it buys time. A lot of people die waiting for transplants. It's at somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of people per year that are waiting for transplant actually die while they're on the waiting list. We just don't have the, the donor hearts available. These particular ones are called saguaro cactus. Vanessa Cirillo wouldn't be climbing the steep barren hills of Arizona today were it not for the three vital months she was sustained by the total artificial heart. My understanding is that if you've had a heart transplant, your heart 
is behind your body in terms of responding to exertion. Yes, it does. Mine takes a little while for right. it to, to get going. But it does going. It does kick in. I'm not going to have to carry you back down. <laughs> no, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Vanessa is a picture of health, a transplant triumph. In 2007, she faced a deadly countdown. A crippling virus was shutting down her heart. A donor was her only hope. I couldn't sleep at night because I couldn't breathe. Um, I couldn't eat. I was I was mobile, but I was totally fatigued because all the fluid in my lungs was hard for me to breathe. So, in fact, your life was in danger. Yes. The total artificial heart saw her through. The wait for a transplant was no longer a death sentence. It was a miracle. I mean, that that machine is just, and the ideas behind it is just absolute miracle. And I felt instantly better. Vanessa was dead, essentially, when she came in. She was a young person who was going to die. What is wonderful is when you can help someone young like Vanessa, more so than someone like myself who's had a reasonable innings. I wouldn't count you out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just give us another hundred then. The perennial problem with medical technology is how to replicate evolution's time-tested design especially matching what nature manages in such a tiny space. Uh, as you can hear, it's, it's not the quietest thing, but it's better than the alternative, which is uh, no noise at all. Wayne's artificial heart is up and running, but he has a long way to go to recovery and a full heart transplant. Hello, mate. How you going? Good to see you. But he's feeling the best he has in good. years. It's bloody noisy in here, though. Yeah. They can see what they choose, can they? The only catch, his stopgap heart is a little noisy and a bit unwieldy. At this point, the next stage is a real heart and a normal life. Before, the next stage was death. Nothing to look forward to. Hi. There's still many a slip ahead. Hey, mate, how are you going? The surgeon, Paul Jantz, the focus now is on getting Wayne a heart transplant. This one drives the, the left side of it and this one drives the right side of it. That means finding a suitable donor and then hoping that Wayne's body won't reject the new organ. We're halfway there with Wayne, he's, st he's still on a journey. And, and it's not just any heart, but one that is tissue type more yeah, than his type. Yeah, we, we, we have to match the, the blood type and the tissue type and we also have to match the size. I can remember being taken off the life support system. As Australia's first pin-up patient of heart transplants, Fiona Coote is a living reminder of those pioneering days when a donor heart had to be found straight away or the patient faced certain death. And 26 years later, you're looking terrific. Yeah, look, I'm and well, feeling good. Yeah, well and yeah, very few dramas, so I'm really lucky. Back then, in 1984, finding a transplant heart for this 14-year-old farm girl was the first problem. But fooling her body into letting it stay would be a lifelong challenge. It stops the um, body rejecting the heart, I think. Mm -hmm. In other words, this is keeping you going. Yep. These are all the anti-rejection ones. It's quite a cocktail. Even today, every morning, every night, Fiona must take anti-rejection drugs. Are they expensive? Some of them are very expensive. Um, but thankfully, it's all subsidised. It's all on me. national health. Yes. Yeah. As it should be. I don't mind paying for you, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> but this tiny device might relegate traditional transplants and their many complications to the medical history books. So the blood without the oxygen comes to the right side, gets spun around, pumped to the lungs, picks up the oxygen, comes back to the left side of the heart, spun back around and ejected to the rest of the body. Here at Prince Charles Hospital in Brisbane, researchers are designing a world-first mechanical heart. 
small enough and reliable enough More to do away forever medicine. with donor heart transplants. Look, it's a brilliant design. In charge of this grand medical adventure is a native Scot turned patriotic Australian, Dr John Fraser. And the really clever piece is the spinning impeller inside, which spins like the front doors of a hotel, spins the blood out, spurts it out, at around between two to 3,000 revs People per come in, people go People out. come out, red cells go in, red cells come out, without oxygen, with oxygen. How bloody clever are you blokes? <laughs> bloody clever, mate, bloody clever. Oh, you've got a good Australian accent, then. We know we don't need anti-rejection drugs. We know that it's on the shelf. We know we don't have to wait for a donor to come available where you might die whilst waiting for the donor. Now it's simple demographics isn't it? As the Australian population ages, the more heart attacks we're going to have. The incidence of heart failure is doubling every 10 years and the number of donors is staying static. So as the problem gets bigger and the donor pool stays the same, there's a huge increasing unmet need. The next step, John Fraser and his team will later this year implant their mechanical heart into a sheep. And if that works, the next scientific leap will be to trial it in a human being. They will charge across the skin, there'll be no wires, there'll be no breach in the skin, the patient will be totally wired. So like charging your, recharging your mobile phone without using a cell Without any wire, without any wire. Just in close proximity. Wire feed, you can go swimming, go surfing. Does it speak to you when you're running low so you remember to charge it? It'll speak only in a <laughs> Scottish accent. <laughs> Ten. And yet, for all this amazing science, one can't help but feel some mysteries of the heart remain. Such as why Vanessa, whose donor was an amateur boxer, is now herself a convert to that sport. Even for experts, some matters of the heart defy science. It's hard to say that that couldn't happen because when you do transplant a solid organ, you do uh, transplant a huge amount of, of, uh, of DNA. So you do keep your mind open? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm skeptical uh, to the max, but, you know, it's just possible that, that crazy theory might be true. <laughs> if you have an artificial heart, anything's possible. Well, yeah, it is, it's a pretty dramatic and miraculous thing. Miracle, not just for patients like Wayne. Yeah, it's good. It sounds like? It like a horse running. But also for those they it? hold closest to their Slow. heart. Softly. But no. you're not going to be sick. I'm not going to be sick anymore. Only a little bit, or no. not? Not sick anymore. Now we can go and play and swim, have fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll be alive. <laughs> There was nothing not to love about Celeste. How did this ever happen? She was asleep in her bed, in our home. Celeste Manor, stalked and murdered. Oh my God, he killed her! Paramedics said, you know who did this? I said, yeah. <laughs> yes! By a man she barely knew. Former work colleague who had developed an infatuation. infatuation. Coming up on 60 Minutes. Court decided to grant him mercy, even though he showed Celeste none. A mother demands answers. When you walk into the police station, what do they say to you? Nothing. Why were police powerless to stop this barbaric crime? There is nothing that is about the victim. The victim doesn't exist. 